Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club World Affairs program. My name is Quentin Hardy. I am the head of editorial at Google Cloud. And today, it is my pleasure to introduce Paul Starobin, author of Putin's Exiles, Their Fight for a Better Russia. It's the story of the one million Russians who have left Russia since the invasion of Ukraine, and what their story tells us about the present and future of Russia. Paul's been writing about Russia and Russians for more than 25 years. He's a former Moscow bureau chief for Business Week and a former contributing editor of The Atlantic. And just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for Paul, please submit those in the chat and we'll get to them later in our program. Now, Putin's Exiles is the story of the diaspora of intellectuals, media figures, politicians, business people, religious figures, and ordinary Russians who have left their homeland behind in the wake of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Relying on his extensive knowledge of Russian history and painstaking interviews with Russians across Europe, Central Asia, and the US, Paul gives us a portrait of a diverse group each hoping and seeking to make a change and united in their detestation for what Russia has become. It is not a Pollyanna view. Paul is mindful of the long odds these exiles face and the reality that many in Russia continue to support both Putin and his bellicose aims for Russia. Nor does he ignore the infighting and soul searching that this sets, that's, it besets so many of these exiles. The result is an informative and moving study that tells us much about what Russia has become and what it may be. So welcome, Paul. And let, Thank me start, you. let me start by asking you, what led you to write this book? Yes, well, thank you. Um, as you say, I've been, in one way or another, I've been involved with Russia for probably about a quarter of a century. And my initial idea was that I would go inside of Russia and maybe visit some places that, you know, outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg, the journalists don't usually get to and maybe pick up on some of the aspects or wrinkles of Russia that are not so familiar to Western uh, readers and viewers. But that was quickly frustrated by the war and the Russian foreign ministry was not particularly interested as far as I could tell in having me visit Russia. So as a kind of mm. alternative, uh, I thought about, well, you know, maybe I can talk to the Russians who are now <laughs> leaving Russia in droves. And also, in a way, it would be a book about Russia and Russians, just, you know, from a different vantage point. I also thought that the experience of exile could be interesting in and of itself, because it is a Russian, not only a Russian, but certainly a distinctively Russian in terms of the context of their history experience. Uh, I think it's the flip side of repression or autocracy, basically. When you have repression and increased repression, uh, you have uh, greater flows of exiles. And in one way or another, that's been happening at least back to the 19th century in Russia. And I think you identify something very interesting there, that that sense of dissent and exile and change from outside does have a long tradition inside Russia. Can you tell our, the viewers a little bit about that tradition, including how this version now is both the same and different from its precursors? Right. Well, I think um, if we go back to the 19th century, for example, we see figures, uh, sort of reform-oriented Russians, people like Alexander Hartson, who left Russia, you know, fleeing the czar, fleeing, you know, his views were simply uh, unacceptable to to Tsarist Russia, at least to the authorities. Uh, he was against serfdom, for example, which was an institution in Russia. So he flees, he goes to Europe, he starts a journal, it's called The Bell. Uh, he's in London and Paris. There are other like-minded people like him. There's this pipeline of information uh, back then. It's not the digital world, but still, there is a pipeline of information. He's able to obtain you know, all sorts of uh, you know, anecdotes and, and pieces of information about what's happening inside of Russia, various kinds of corruption and malfeasance, for example, which are in his journal and which we are told even managed to reach the highest circles of the Kremlin. Uh, the, uh, so so uh, that kind of thing has been going on for a long time. And indeed, when there was a new czar, Alexander II, he instituted a whole spate of reforms, including uh, the abolition of serfdom, that in some ways you could probably say in a kind of atmospheric way, you know, the exiles helped to kind of sow the seeds uh, for those kinds of reforms. So that's one example from the 19th century. And then, of course, we have, if you move the uh, 
you know, the, the timeline closer to the 20th century and into the 20th century, we get figures like Lenin and Trotsky, who spent the better part of their lives uh, in exile because they were basically wanted criminals uh, inside of Russia. And Lenin, sent in by the Germans on a sealed train uh, in World War I, uh, managed to take uh, power in, in Petrograd and introduce the Russian Revolution. And then we had a new wave of exiles, the so-called white exiles at odds with the Reds, who left again in hopes of uh, restoring the czar. And of course, that never happened. They fragmented. So both of those examples, in a way, can give you a, a context for what's happening now, where the current wave of exiles is basically of an anti-Putin and anti-war character. And it began to flow out a little bit uh, on Putin's uh, coming to power. I mean, remember, he's been in power now for about 25 years, but it really accelerated with the war when it became almost impossible for Russian journalists, for example, to do their job because just to say that there was a war was a criminal offense. It became impossible for almost anyone who uh, had in some public way declared themselves to be against Putin or the war to survive there. And so you had this mass wave of exiles and it was supplemented as well by people who were simply against, you know, they did not want to be conscripted. So, you know, just to save their skins, they fled Russia. So those were the sorts of people that I met when I, you know, began to gather my, you know, reporting for this project. Yes, and you speak of them early on. You say the war in Ukraine, which really is the engine for the departure for most of them. Most. The war in Ukraine has started a new epoch in Russian history, a new chapter in which the exiles are an actor and possibly an author of the outcome. Can you say a little bit more about this new epoch and how can they be an author of the outcome, you believe? Well, I think the war in Ukraine in some ways is a culmination of Putin's uh, rule, which has become increasingly repressive and autocratic over his time in office. But at the same time, it crossed, uh, you know, it, it did start the new era in, in, in being such a, a radical and, and really unexpected step, I think, to most Russians, even those Russians who supported uh, Putin. He had fomented a war, a much smaller conflict in eastern Ukraine uh, with the annexation of Crimea in 2014. But the invasion of February 2022 really, I think, shocked most Russians and, and was a kind of existential question for many of them as to what we are now going to do. I think that the exiles um, can, you know, we, we can we can say with some caution, but nevertheless can play uh, a role as the authors of the outcome because they have, the more politically minded of them, have organized in opposition to Putin in exile, and they are doing various things such as, you know, creating their own uh, media outlets that in the Russian language are returning uh, a lot of, you know, anti-Putin anti and anti-war messaging back inside of Russia. YouTube, for example, is still open inside of Russia. Uh, Telegram, the social media channel, is still open inside of Russia. So there's actually a lot of potential for the Russians inside of Russia to get this kind of messaging and, and, and programming that is, of course, not available to them from in Russia channels, which are largely controlled by the state. So there's an information war. That would be one dimension of what I am talking about. I'm interested in how the West views the exiles and do they use them? One of the, you mentioned Lenin in his exile. And mm -hmm. to the end of his life, Alan Dulles, who became the head of the CIA, regretted turning down a meeting with Lenin when he was in the embassy in Switzerland. He was too busy mm -hmm. to meet with this, you know, petty little mm -hmm. dissident and regretted right. not doing that. And then, of course, the CIA, you know, fed Radio Free Europe, fed Russians in exile, encouraged the white Russians, like the U.S. government encouraged against Russia. What mm -hmm. is the policy of the West toward the Russians' exiles now? I don't think we have a very well-developed policy, which I think is a problem and a missed opportunity. Uh, we are so focused, I mean, it's understandable, but we've been so focused on the war in Ukraine and on the immediate you know, imperative of, of helping to stand up to the Ukrainians that I think we've sort of left uh, un, un, um, resolved or, or have not paid attention to uh, these exiles for the most part. And it's complicated because there are so many Ukrainian uh, 
uh, refugees as well, or you know, people who have left the country have been forced to leave the country, and there's been a lot of efforts uh, to to get them help. So I think the Russian exiles have been largely uh, neglected, and I think that's unfortunate because, um, in a way, just as in the Cold War, uh, we would be standing up for, essentially for a resistance, a native resistance uh, to Putin and to his policies to an autocrat, uh, if you will, just as we had in the Soviet time to, to Moscow. But I don't think that we have quite come to terms with that. And I don't think, you know, it's understandable. We would not want to be perhaps directly aiding the exile outlets because that would play into Putin's message that these exiles, the more politically active of them, are just kind of tools of Washington. We don't want that. But at the same time, I talk about this in the book, outlets like TV Rain, uh, Dost, which is, you know, very much anti-Putin and anti-war in characters, you know, struggle to survive right now from their base in, in Amsterdam. It's almost impossible for them to monetize their audience back in Russia because, you know, those people cannot, you know, advertisers are not going to be on that platform and nobody can contribute money except perhaps covertly in you know in crypto funds something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. i just want to note we're already getting some questions in so please keep them coming i will get to them in just a little bit let's drill into the book a little bit more you organize it for the most part around different types of dissident groups the mm -hmm. church media business people technologists um in some ways you know funding building ways to, uh, the businessmen in particular were interesting and the technologists because they're almost actively against uh, Russia inside Ukraine, funding things and building systems to Some fight against. Are. Yep. More broadly though, talk a little bit about why you chose these groups and what you found most compelling about them. Well, I was looking for different dimensions of the exile experience, you know, no, knowing that this is just not simply one, you know, homogenous group. Mm -hmm. And I guess I decided as the way that I would tell the story of the book, it made more sense to treat things in that kind of thematic way, dividing them into groups as opposed to attempting to, to tell like a chronological narrative or something like that, which wouldn't, you know, categorize them. And also, I think people should be aware of just how different they are. And so, for example, um, uh, I focused on a dissident Orthodox Russian priest in Batumi on the western shores uh, of the Black Sea in Georgia, uh, who had fled from his prestigious post in Moscow, just a church, just you know, on Red Square, paces from the Kremlin, with his wife. Orthodox priests are allowed to to marry, and I found him in Batumi driving a taxi cab and. I found that one to be provocative and interesting because it's not the usual picture, and this is something that kind of guided me throughout, of certainly the Russian Orthodox Church, which understandably uh, in the West has this reputation for being, you know, very much tied to the state, uh, believing in autocracy, all those sorts of things, and yet the Russian Orthodox Church is is quite more textured than that, and has had a populist tradition, for example, which goes back, you know, many, many, many years. And this priest, Father Oleg, whom I found with his wife, Maria, seemed to kind of reflect that. So that's fascinated me. Uh, also, you know, there's a, a saying uh, in among Russian philosophers that the Russians uh, often can go to extremes. And although that can, you know, sound like a great generalization, I think to some degree it's true that once they take a stance it may be a radical and a militant stance, and they're going to follow that to the end. So in my chapters, uh, my chapter on sort of the warrior Russians, I focused on a, a physicist, a really brilliant f physicist from Siberia, uh, who is also a Siberian nationalist. You know, he believes Russia is so big. Who among it's, us? It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's ungovernable, right? It's just a, you know, just Mikhail, just sort of a fascinating figure. And when I met with him on Zoom, he was in Munich at the time. He told me about his exploits in helping um, with his, his buddy, who was a Ukrainian physicist, to fashion this noise sensor system that would serve as an anti-missile, anti-drone system that could be deployed in Ukraine. And it was early in the year, and so successfully that he was given an award, which he proudly displayed to me uh, by the Ukrainian armed forces. So, you know, th this, this too, uh, I don't know how it 
it, it seems rather extreme and certainly d dangerous to engage in such pursuits. So mm. I was impressed that the Russians, some Russians were really willing to put it uh, on the line. So yeah, in a way, it's a kind of a kaleidoscope of you know this this kind of of, of portrait of the Russians uh, in exiles, and you're finding many different uh, types. Yeah, I mean, one thing that comes through, and maybe this is what it takes to be a vocal exile to begin with, is the uh, strength of belief they hold and mm -hmm. the desire to not be silenced that just shoots through whatever process they're in. And yeah. In, I found that in particular among the Navalny people, if you want to talk about them. because We'll they, turn they, to them in a minute because that's a okay. particularly um, acute and prob more problematic look than almost any of the others, I think. But in looking at the media group and the business group and the technology group and the religious group, I don't know if it was your intention, but in each case, it illuminated a kind of level of corruption or decay in their counterparts back in Russia. The media is a Putin stooge. The businessmen owe total fealty to Putin and build him a, basically a castle on the Black Sea. The technologists right. enable a surveillance authoritarianism 24-7. And the church is, you know, uh, fulminating um, arch nationalism and hatred under uh, Patriarch Kirill. Uh, how did... Do you believe those kind of uh, situations are, those institutions in Russia today are sustainable? Well, was that an accurate portrayal of them to begin with? Are they sustainably powerful or is this a sign of their decline that they are in this state? Right. I think it's a largely accurate portrait. I, I think with respect to the technologists, um, among the sort of technology minded people I found in Russia, I have found in Russia, um, working for companies like Yandex, for example, which has often been called Russia's uh, Google, uh, had a lot of really, you know, smart, you know, computer people, software people and so forth. I think they were generally opposed to Putin, uh, but they tended not to be the most committed and the most political right. uh, of the group. And many of them who fled Russia, I think, were doing so partly because they knew they could work remotely. You said 10% you know, you know, of the IT people have left Russia and they really didn't skip like a that. beat in their jobs. Probably, well, probably not. And some of the, yes, and, and new work. I have not pursued this at, at great length, but I know in places like Serbia and Berlin and other places, you know, there are Russians who are now working, you know, for, for company software tech firms that have relocated there. So it's kind of this complicated resort, resorting of things. I think with respect to the church, uh, though, that's really on point because the Russian Orthodox Church is traditionally led by a patriarch, who in this case is Patriarch Kirill, who has formed, and Putin has certainly cultivated, you know, very close ties. Uh, and you have this kind of age-old affiliation, really, between the top of the church and the top of the state. And they've concocted this really kind of preposterous, you know, ideology known as Ruski Mir, which has, you know, no basis in the Christian Gospels, certainly, which is a basically about, it's kind of a justification for the gathering of, you know, quote unquote, Russian peoples, uh, wherever they may be across borders. So one of the justifications for the invasion of Ukraine is that Ukraine itself is an artificial entity, an artificial society, and the, the Ukrainians really are truly Russians, so they should be gathered under this Russian roof. But I find that some priests, uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church, just completely re reject that. You know, it's antithetical to their principles. It's antithetical to the Gospels. And so you have had, I mean, it's not large, but there has been this kind of dissident uh, pushback. I discuss in the book, you know, there's a very charismatic uh, priest, uh, Father Alexander Men, who just as the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, and of course religion had been repressed, was preaching this kind of gospel, uh, you know, not so much the Gilded Domes, but, you know, the, the people's church. He was murdered. He was murdered brutally with an axe on his, you know, in the forest on his way to the railroad station one day in 1990. But mm -hmm. he remained uh, an inspiration uh, for the father, Father Oleg, whom I met with in Batumi, and his wife. So that kind of dissident strain of the church interests me. And there are others who I've talked to who hope for 
you know, even as much of a reformation of the Russian Orthodox Church to detach it from the state to kind of end that age old affiliation. I think with the media that you mentioned, that's also, I think, quite on point. I mean, the Russian with the collapse of the Soviet Union or even even earlier, I mean, there was a very active uh, media in Russia that was committed, you know, to basically being as independent as possible and, you know, speaking truth to power, the the usual role mm-hmm. of journalists. I was in Russia in 1998 and met with some of those people. And then you, could, you could see that this is really taking on. And in the Yeltsin time, before Putin came into power, there were television stations, there were newspapers, there were lots of outlets that were, you know, not covering the news, uh, satirizing the news. I mean, just everything that you would expect. Putin basically put an end to that and did his best to corrupt the media and to basically fold them into his larger, you know, program. And many of them accepted that, some did not. And among those uh, who did not, it sort of came to a head with the invasion of Ukraine when it came became basically impossible for these journalists to do their jobs. And that's the example in the book of TV Rain, Dost, uh, which was founded as an independent uh, television outlet in Moscow, uh, but in the Putin years, but it just became untenable for them. So they, the outlet, you know, the, they basically fled to Russia. You have other outlets as well. Medusa is a, is a very good independent uh, outlet in the Russian news, which is based in Riga. And also they're doing all their work in in Russian. So you have this almost it's like a civil war that's going on between these, mm. you know, the, the information outlets in Russia and outside of Russia. You've really identified some interesting tensions there between um, where Russia begins and ends in the eyes of the church or the struggle for authoritarianism versus freedom in Russia. And this mm-hmm. touches on a very timeless kind of issue that I'm sure you encountered, which is this battle for what used to be called Russia's soul. You know, mm. that, you know, what is it? Well, you, you said a really interesting theme. Here was another ripe theme. The shame of the Russian national family for its manifold crimes, which yeah. is, a, you know, goes back to Dostoevsky or before, that this is a theme Very much. about Russian history and this sense of this collective soul that kind of doesn't know where to place itself. How do you account for this idea? Because I don't, see it in most countries. Does Russia occupy some special place because of its unusual demography and geography, the way it's spread across Europe and Asia, the concentration of a European population that also feels kind of other, some stranger characteristic than that, perhaps? Well, I think there is a kind of communal aspect to Russian society, which is generally absent in the West, um, and which in, you know, sort of broad terms, at least from the Russian perspective, is thought to be more materialistic, you know, more individualistic, more concerned with, you know, things like prosperity, the, you know, bread over over spirit. I mean, that's in very broad terms, and that's a theme that <clears throat> obsessed Dostoevsky, for example. And it might have been an exaggerated picture of the West, and it might have been in some terms uh, an idealized, you know, picture of, of Russia. I mean, mm. Dostoevsky in many ways was a Russian nationalist. Nevertheless, I do think there is something to it, and what struck me, and this was not something, you know, one always goes into a book project hoping to be surprised, you know, by something. I mean, you don't want all of sure. your sort of, you know, preconceived notions to be... You're your out. life. You don't want to stay with it if you're getting bored. Right. And I didn't even have that many preconceived notions. I mean, I wanted to be a sponge. You know, mm. that's my, my metaphor for, you know, being a reporter. When you go as a foreign correspondent in particular into some place where you haven't been before, at least in my case, hadn't been for a while, you're just kind of soaking it up and you'll give yourself plenty of time to distill things later. So one of the first things that I soaked up was this sense of of guilt. Um, I met with a writer in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. Uh, we had a, a drink, uh, it was in the early evening, and one of the first things she asked me was, are, you, are we guilty? Uh, she just kind of put it wow. to me. Which, yeah, I think is kind of a question I would probably How did you ne- never get. <laughs> well, I, how did, I, well, my first thought, of of, of course, uh, was was to try to ev- evade it entirely by by uh, asking me, uh, yeah, are you 
am I here to judge you or something? And she said, mm. no, but I'm just interested in your opinion. Well, I mean, it, I think in asking that question, it was a little bit, you know, asked and answered. I mean, she, you don't ask a question like that unless you feel like there is some some guilt. Right. So um, I thought about it and and fleshed out my answer really better, I think, in, in writing than, than to her. But there is a kind of, I hesitate to use the word collective guilt, but you know, Russia invades Ukraine. Okay, Putin made that decision, not everyone underneath him, but all these soldiers go. There's this kind of extraction of Ukrainian children up to military age who were brought to these re-education camps in Russia. Uh, are the people administering these camps, are the people who are, you know, making the food and all that kind of stuff, are they guilty in some way? So I think it's a rather complicated question. But what impressed upon me, and perhaps this is distinctively Russian, I'm not sure, but I mean, I think many Germans, of course, felt a great sense of, of guilt about their various uh, uh, crimes. But the sense I had was that they just, they did feel guilty. And partly it was the guilt of inaction, that they felt they hadn't done enough during the Putin years to oppose him, that they had accepted a kind of bargain, a bargain that he pretty much offered them, at least implicitly, which was to stay out of politics. And in return, you can essentially have your life, you know, your private life, your family life, just don't get involved in these political matters that don't concern you. So many of the exiles I was talking to had accepted that bargain. I talked to, for example, a young man, uh, in the fashion industry who um, liked Putin in the beginning and you know happily accepted that bargain and is only now feeling kind of guilty about it. And if not exactly guilt, there's a sense of shame, not quite the same thing. You know, and one of the exiles said to me, look, Paul, what if uh, my brother murdered somebody? Uh, am I guilty? No. Do I feel shame? Yes, I feel shame for the family. And I think that goes deeply into the kinds of themes that Dostoevsky, for example, was writing about in his last book, The Brothers, you know, Karamazov, when he described Russia as this kind of reckless, you know, ch chariot going off the rails. And, you know, everyone is responsible for everyone. I mean, that's kind of his, his grand theme. Yeah, there is a sense of we are a family as a nation that yes. you don't find in many countries in the West. And Putin is seen as the head of this family. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, he occupies this kind of czar-like role. Uh, you wanted, I once spoke to a person who supposedly was his, you know, person, the person that Putin confessed to, and he described Putin as the first face, the privio litso of Russia, the patriarch. And, you know, there's a lot of patriarchal, patriarchal aspects to Russia uh, from its orthodox uh, Christian heritage. So Putin kind of being the father is also going to be the target of a rebellion, of an anti, you know, authority rebellion, which is a theme that, you know, Ivan Turgenev wrote about in the 19th century in Fathers and Sons, which in the original Russian is actually translates as it, it is uh, fathers and deity, fathers and children. So it's a perennial theme in Russian, in the Russian experience to have these generational rebellions. And it's also noteworthy that many of the exiles I spoke to were of the younger generations, and a number of them had deep issues and battles with their fathers uh, and mothers who did not agree with them on politics and who did not agree that they should be taking a strong stand against Putin because it wasn't good for them. Yes, you spoke of one woman who was photographed in a demonstration and her mother calls up screaming at her. Basically, yeah. disowns her on the phone. They patch it up later, but it's quite vivid. Yeah, that's one of the, my my stories. You know how it is when if you write, uh, you spend long enough with these characters, you begin to adopt them as your own. Uh, so that's uh, Nastia's story. Nastia was a, I met her in Yerevan, but her backstory was that she grew up in a village in uh, Karelia, which is sort of northwestern Russia on the border with Finland. Uh, a really bright person, went to the medical institute, wanted a residency or an internship in neurology. Uh, was warned by a professor, uh, you know, not to take part in any kind of political demonstrations, and you know, which there were at that time in St. Petersburg against Putin. She told me she would rather put a gun to her head than you know risk her medical diploma. And yet, you know, the war, uh, she leaves. You know, she gives that up. When I find her, she's studying Ukrainian. Uh, she tells me this story that you know the clash with her mother, who she wanted to say basically did understand what she was doing. It's just that her mother was so upset about it. 
And she told me she hoped that at some point she could go to Ukraine and help to restore the country. So, yeah, I found that to be a pretty dramatic I mean, it's a, it's a very poignant and kind of painful story because these yeah. exiles do yearn for the resolution or the proper conduct of their family, and they wish to return to it. Let's turn to one more group we haven't touched on yet, which is quite important in your story, and that's the exile from within, Alexander Navalny and his mm -hmm. exile supporters. Speak a little bit about Navalny because, I mean, Navalny was, is the politician who was poisoned. He recovered in Germany. Uh, his opposition to Putin was so strong that he then returned to Russia knowing he would be thrown back in jail where he is right. today. And he has this very strong um, support group, how, organization mm -hmm. in Europe and the US. He's kind of a darling in the U.S. for his sacrifice, but you seem to have somewhat mixed feelings about him. Well, I would say somewhat mixed feelings, perhaps more about his uh, the movement and the organization that is associated with his name. With Navalny, whom I have never met, but uh, I mean, he does have a, you know, maybe his, his story is a little bit interesting here to elucidate. When he came onto the scene, he was both a kind of anti-corruption activist uh, and politician, but also something of a nationalist. Pretty fierce uh, xenophobe when you come down to it. He caught some flack for that, understandably, and Moscow liberals were not entirely sure what to make of him on those grounds. I mean, was it an act? Was he just, you know, this kind of way that he could connect in a kind of populist way with the average Russian, but in any case, there was no denying his charisma, and in, on those grounds alone, he became a very prominent person in the Putin opposition. So when he uh, is poisoned, it's really an attempted assassination attempt effort by, I think, undoubtedly Russian security services. But in ne and nevertheless, he goes to Germany, as you say. And then I think in his mind, at least as, as it, it's been described to me by friends, he thought it was a kind of philosophical act of defiance to return to Russia, knowing what would happen to him. And that would be a, a statement that, you know, would stand for it itself. I think he also thought it would mean a deeper bond with the Russian people who can appreciate that kind of suffering. And it was interesting that he also said that, you know, I am a Christian now, by which he meant not so much that he had, you know, read the Bible and he was now, you know, adopting the, the rituals of, of the church, but he was kind of identifying himself, you know, with the, the powerless, with, you know, the more sort of pure aspects of the church and what it meant to be a Christian when Christians were persecuted as they, you know, routinely w were. I mean, uh, so, so all those things, I think, you know, gave his message a certain power and resonance. I mean, people are always complicated, but there yes. is no doubting his courage. I mean, that's a, you can say it's a philosophical statement, but he is throwing his body straight into the gears of the machine. You know, and that's Ab there. absolutely you know. and and almost like a living martyr where I have some problems with the organization is and it's a little bit of a work in, in progress. But initially, so Navalny's in, in is locked up in Russia. There is a anti-corruption foundation, which is essentially Navalny's project, which is based in Vilnius in Lithuania. His chief of staff, uh, Leonid Volkov, is a very controversial figure within the exile movement. He's just kind of, <laughs> how to put it, he can be rude, he doesn't play well with others. And to be fair, I think following Navalny's instructions, uh, his policy was not to cooperate with others in exile of a similar political mind. So for example, uh, you know, Gary Kasparov, the former Soviet chess champion, he wanted to organize a political Congress where the exiles could get together and meet and discuss their common aims and methods and so forth in Vilnius. And even though it was in, you know, the, the hometown uh, at that point of Leonid Volkov, the Navalny team, he refused to participate. He said, you know, you do your thing, we'll do our thing. And so 
that I think is um, from the outside. I, I view that as a mistake, in the sense that I think the Navalny team can keep its integrity while at the same time, you know, cooperating uh, with others. But they haven't done that, and uh, you know, currently Navalny's organization is headed by a woman named Maria Pevchek, who's a brilliant investigator. She's the one directing the team that has done so many exposés of corruption in Russia, like Putin's palace and so mm. forth. But I am told, I haven't talked to Marie in a while, but I'm told that she is less inclined towards the political organizing aspect of the mission. So s some people feel like that's gone neglected as, as well. Right. The impression I got was the Navalny camp, whether or not this is him, but perhaps it is, has a sense that if and when this collapses, we can sweep up all the chips, which is a bit of a little more Lenin than it is Hertzen when you come down. To <laughs> yeah, it. exactly. I, well, I think that's right. I think that uh, Volkov. I mean, I listened to him on the on the sidelines. Uh, he accepted a a prize for Navalny in absentia in New York, uh, NYU, a couple of years ago, and. He talked about just that. I mean, he was saying, you know, after Stalin died, there was this vicious scrum, uh, you know, who was going to be the new, you know, leader of, of Russia. And nobody at that point could really even determine it. But you had to be prepared for that moment. So he related that sort of parable in the sense that the Navalny team wants to be ready for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just to give this also another uh, a gloss on it, I think some of the foot soldiers that Navalny has a Navalny team are really quite I impressive. I met uh, one such person, uh, Daniel in Yerevan, who described to me his experiences of uh, being as a member of the Navalny organization. He was actually in Siberia when uh, Navalny was poisoned and kind of kept vigil there. And, you know, there could be no doubting his, his commitment, uh, the sort of spirit uh, that he has. I mean, these people are all in. Uh, they cannot go back to Russia. as. Mm. Many exiles, frankly, can if they have not committed any really overt, you know, anti-Putin political acts, and, and some do. But the Navalny people, anyone associated with Navalny, uh, they they cannot go back. Under they've the crossed. Current regime. They've yep. crossed, and so yeah, I was thinking a little bit of like the hard men of the, you know, Irish Republican yeah, Army, as they used right. to be called. I mean, you know, they they they're battle tested, they're seasoned, uh, they know what they're about, and the, you know, they're just, they're committed. Mm -hmm. I have such a list of excellent questions. I'm going to start a little bit early and I'll just start as they came in order. Uh, what do you believe is the biggest misconception about Russia or Russians that Americans have? <laughs> well, based on the presentation in popular culture that they're all, you know, either, either vicious oligarchs or, uh, or, or KGB men or, or gangsters or, or uh, you know, beautiful fetching women with, you know, blonde with impossibly long legs. I mean, where does one start? I, I think that I think we've just, you know, endlessly caricatured the Russians and also with the cooperation probably of our national security establishment have, you know, attempted to turn them into our permanent adversaries, which I think is unfortunate because Russia is such, such a big country uh, you cannot, you know, just uniformly characterize 145 odd million people that way, no matter what one thinks of, you know, the, the Kremlin and the gang that's running the Kremlin. And yes, there are Russian oligarchs. Absolutely. I've met probably just about all of them, or the ones that mattered anyway, when I lived and worked in, in Russia. Uh, but even those people cannot easily be caricatured in, in, my, in my mind. So I just think that, you know, my message to Americans is, uh, I don't know, read more Russian literature uh, mm -hmm. and try to understand the complexity and the various textures of any large, you know, society. Yes. And talk to exiles, perhaps. You can meet them yeah. in many cities. Talk to exiles. But, you know, on that point, uh, they're not uh, very popular <laughs> these days. And so there are Russians who, uh, in exile, who are kind of reluctant to stand up as Russians now mm. because they feel that all Russians have essentially been tarred with one brush. I mean, the Russians, this is a bit of a segue, but I was in Ukraine last September and you know the whole issue with the Russian language is a very live one. I mean, are you Russian if you speak Russian? I don't think so, but there are people in Ukraine, Ukrainian nationalists who do take that uh, 
point of view. So the whole issue of the Russian language has become quite contentious. Yes, you away from the sort of identities these people occupy in the story, there is their individual experience. And yeah. I want you to touch on that for just a bit. What is the condition of exile? Because in Yerevan and Tbilisi and Lithuania, sometimes they're encountering graffiti or hostility in yeah. other forms about these Russian interlopers, get out of here, stop driving prices up, what have you. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't know if we're in a, a family-friendly uh, uh, environment or not, but I mean, the reality is you go into Tbilisi, which is the capital of Georgia, and you will be met immediately with fuck Russia graffiti. I mean, it's it's everywhere. We'll beep that part. Uh, <laughs> we'll beep that part. Uh, I was, you know, it, maybe perhaps somewhat naively, I, because I could speak some conversational Russian, I was sort of looking forward to, uh, you know, I engaging a little bit of that in uh in Tbilisi and I checked into my hotel. I got up, you know, the next morning, eager beaver. I approached the lady at the omelet station and asked for my omelet, uh, omelet in, in Russian. And she said, uh, sir, I understand Russian, but I prefer not to speak the right. Russian language. So this hotel was, was full of, 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 you know, of exiles who, who were doing their best to kind of stumble through. I mean, none of them could really speak Georgian. It's a very difficult language. Most of them could speak some kind of you know, broken English or something. So they, you know, they could make themselves understood, but it, it it's a humbling and to some degree humiliating experience for them. Um, it's difficult because their bank accounts might be shut down or hard to access their, the conditions of their residency in these host countries uh, may be ambiguous or just subject to rapid change, in which case they might have to leave? Are they going to be able to get a, a job? Um, you know, so all of those kind of, you know, the condition of exile can be, you know. Yeah, and in this case, their family stressful. and friends have often rejected them for their choices. Yes, so they're in this kind of no man's. Right. I think in some countries, it's it's better than others. I think the most difficult time, other than Georgia's probably right now, is in some of the Baltic countries, because, I mean, it's understandable. They're you know, up against Russia d directly, there's just so much, you know, agitation back and, and forth. And uh, there's a great distrust of the Russian populations in places like Latvia, those populations are substantial. And Putin himself tries to whip up this issue because his big thing is I'm gonna protect Russian speaking people. So you have quite a bit of, of tension in those communities. I think it gets easier for them, The you know, in places like Germany and, France and perhaps the UK, but but still, those are expensive places to mm. live, relatively speaking. Mm. So many of these exiles are in the former Soviet republics, as you might expect, where there's more Russian spoken and it's cheaper. So everywhere from former Soviet Central Asia, like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, to the Southern Caucasus, so Georgia and uh, Armenia. Mm -hmm. Next question here. What do you think is Putin's greatest strength and what is his biggest weakness or challenge? His greatest strength, well, I mean, I think that he had instincts which served him well upon entering office, relatively unskilled in exercising leadership at that kind of level. And those instincts were of a kind of conservative kind, although not necessarily in the worst sense of conservative at that time, because there'd been so much uh, almost di disorder in the 1990s under Yeltsin. I mean, there was a financial crisis in August of 1998. The oligarchs associated with Yeltsin had pretty much run free. Putin's instinct, uh, which was society's instinct, was to rein them in and to realize that Russians uh, feared that kind of disorder and would accept a kind of more of a strongman kind of rule. And that's a different, you know, there's a longer debate there about whether did Putin set out of that time, you know, we're talking about 24 years ago, set out to become, you know, the person that he is now. I think his weakness is, is proving, and we saw this recently, if anyone has seen this, this kind of bizarre, quote unquote, interview with Tucker Carlson, uh, with Putin for two hours, uh, 
And I watched the whole thing because I wanted a sense of, of Putin. I've been watching him for 24 years. I met him in Moscow just before he became president. So I've, I've written about him and all that. So I'm interested in his development as well. I think he's become somewhat de delusional with regard to this kind of greater Russia, Russia building project. He seems to really believe that the Ukrainians in some way want to rejoin Russia as part of a greater Russia. It's a very old Russian idea. It's not the red Russia. People often talk about Putin wanting to build or rebuild the Soviet Union. I don't see that. I think he wants to rebuild a more imperial quote unquote, wh wh white Russia, you know, with the orthodoxy is a pillar of it. But it's just delusional. I mean, I've spent time in Ukraine a little bit. I mean, you don't have to spend a lot of time. They're there not to going see back. Ukrainians are. Yeah. I mean, they they have he has agitated and exacerbated the Ukrainian identity mm. as has been explained to me by Ukrainians. So this is now a, a clash of identities, you know, Russian and Ukrainian. So that's, you know, that's not a good, you know, and, and that's apart from, you know, the question here was about weaknesses. We could talk about other aspects of mm. Putin that I think are pretty, pretty evil, really, but that's not in the category, perhaps, of a weakness. This question is a little away from the book, but I'll draw on your broader expertise. Should we expect Russia to play a role in this year's election like they have done in previous years? Well, probably because... One of the perhaps not well understood aspects of this is that it was Kremlin policy, even during the Soviet time, to try to interfere in our elections. I mean, we they were at the same time our FBI was sort of messing with you know Martin Luther King and, and leaders of the black civil rights movements in the 1960s. So were the KGB, you know, because mm -hmm. they, they saw you know America's sort of racial strife and discord as you know, in a kind of Marxist way, a useful way to kind of expose fissures and fractures uh, in, in America. So Russian disinformation has been a policy for practically forever. I think it became easier to practice in an age of social media and digital media with the bot accounts and things. And but you probably know way more about this than, than I do. But um, I think that level of, of activity will probably continue, although I have no fresh and original reporting on that. So I don't know exactly what the Russians plan for 2024. I think it's fairly obvious that they see Donald Trump as the more you know congenial and, and malleable figure. And Trump has certainly done nothing to dissuade us of, of that you know portrait that they have of him. Um, I think they would seize any agent of chaos they could find. Yeah, and in his and in Trump's case, it could even even more than chaos. It, it it sounds like he he has on his mind basically not honoring NATO's uh, you know deterrent commitments. You know, at least he said something like that recently that seemed to suggest. That. I don't know if it's just bluster or whatever, but that would be a Russian dream or a Kremlin dream that that the United States would essentially be at odds with NATO's core mission of protecting its its members. Mm. Mm. Um, next question. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll go back to one I had for you, which okay. is pegged off this disinformation thing. What's it like for the exiles to live in this world of constant digital media? The media groups, but also the church and the businessmen, whoever, who can leave the country but also kind of occupy some of the information space, remain in Russia in terms of the conversation. As you say, YouTube, Telegram, mm -hmm. there are other ways to get around, but yeah. at the same time contend with both Russian information and grassroots Russians who are on Telegram going viral every other day. Yeah, I mean, the Russians that I speak to and continue to speak to with some of these people that I met, I I, um, I talked to, I think they just, I mean, probably as many people here do in the West, they they just have this, this pretty dense thicket of a digital life, you know, and they're constantly, you know, on their phones. I've got people in London, I you know, a, a woman I spoke with the other day in in Yerevan, uh, just when I'm interested in some new piece of information, I can. It's usually WhatsApp or Signal, 
uh, and they generally pretty responsive and they have this whole, uh, I mean, the resistance has its sort of its own institutions and, and, and people. Now there's mm. all this satire about Putin. Uh, one of the touch points is, uh, you know, Putin has become really virulent, uh, on, uh, LGBT type issues, uh, in presenting them as inimical to Russian values and as, uh, representative of a certain representative of a certain decadence in the mm -hmm. West, uh, and this is he is exposed to various forms of, of ridicule and sophisticated you know irony in exile circles, particularly by younger people, on these points. So it's 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 kind of like right back at you. Right. Uh, I think a lot of this is missed, you know, here in the West because there's only so many things that people can cover, but it's entirely in the Russian language. And I mean, I'm not paying constant attention to it, but my friends will sometimes, I'll say, well, what do you mean? What did they say? And so he'll, you know, I actually have it on my list to talk to this Russian uh, comedian, uh, a woman who is apparently doing some of these things because I'd like to learn more about it. And at the same time, we haven't talked about this, but I think one of the things that's gelled since I've completed most of my research is what I call a certain cultural resistance among the exiles. There are pop singers, as one called uh, Little Coin, Manechko, who is very popular among the exiles and has this anthem song, I Will Survive. There's a comedian, you know, and, and Putin is now trying to extend his repressive net to the exiles in diaspora. And he's the Kremlin has been demanding of countries like Thailand and Indonesia, Dubai, that they don't allow these anti-Putin, anti-war, you know, cultural performers uh, to go on stage. You know, he wants to shut them out and the the Duma in Russia recently passed a law that would confiscate the property of these exiles who are deemed to be, you know, enemies of the state, you know, for their activities abroad. That's I will survive the Donna Summer song. I will. It's I will. Yeah, uh, It's it's uh, it's not the Donna Summer. It's it's her own original song. I'd be happy to get you the lyrics. In fact, I think I might have even sent the uh, I look it's pretty good. It's got the music video has all these images of destruction in Ukraine and so forth. So for the exiles who are watching it, it's 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 pretty moving and galvanizing. And uh, and as you know, sometimes, you know, you can find solidarity more in, sure. you know, music and, and humor than in, you know, just another political protest where somebody holds up a sign. Oh, and there's an emotional truth there that they're finding together, which is kind of poignant. Exactly. Uh, Another question. Is there someone you would have liked to interview for the book, past or present, and what would you have liked to have asked them? Well, I tried hard to get an interview with Khodorkovsky, and I was Mike Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who is one of the former oligarchs who spent some time in jail in Russia. Ten years. Now in London. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I just went back and forth endlessly, you know, as a journalist. And I'm not sure why it, it didn't happen, but I was sort of hoping to... It wouldn't have been crucial to the book, but I wouldn't have minded having his his perspective. Um, but, you know, I feel like I talked to most of the people that I wanted to talk to and that generally people, perhaps surprisingly or not surprisingly, they were interested in talking to me. I might have spent more time among maybe some of the cultural figures but um, and prominent people, but I kind of like mixing in almost at random with some of the, the exiles that I met in places like Tbilisi and Yerevan. In some ways that was more meaningful to me because they were not self- selected mm -hmm. and another question do you think those of us who enjoy such excellent discussions may be ignoring what may be the wishes of the majority of the russian people to be protected by a powerful patriarch <laughs> this gets back to that russian soul we are too big to be to have a democracy we need an authoritarian to run the show our family needs a strong dad yeah it's wrong to, It's a fair point, and I've I probably have written that by, myself at at times over, over you know when I when Putin came into power I was living and working in Russia and of course, like any foreign correspondent whenever I had almost any encounter with with a, a Russian I would ask what do you think of Putin and sometimes the reply was yeah you know Silny Chilovek you know strong man said in a kind of favorable way um, and so yeah I think there are people who feel that way. It's a feeling that's likely to be more prevalent in the provinces than in big cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. You but mean their the version time, of the red states? Yeah. 
You could say that. You could say that. I mean, the, certainly the liberal beating heart of Russia, such as it is, exists in the large metropolises, and particularly in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So you could probably make that, uh, that Well, it's parallel. not a direct parallel, but yeah, the Yeltsin years were, for many people, utter chaos, and yes, particularly right. away from the metropolitan centers. Yeah. So the restoration of order was important to them. That's fair. And I think, you know, and I think that should be acknowledged. And I kind However, of allude to this. This far? Well, I, well I, no, right. Yeah. And I, as I allude to in the book, I think the exile media outlets uh, could do more work towards connecting with sort of ordinary Russian people in giving them a diet that's, you know, not only sort of, you know, anti-war, anti-Putin, but to, you know, speak to them about their economic concerns and so forth, which do. But you know, I would also say, because I don't think this is, it's, it's sort of reported in the West, but not on a consistent basis. There are, for example, Russian uh, mothers and wives whose sons and husbands are in Ukraine on the battlefront, and they're feeling very frustrated because they're not getting rotated out. And so that's a potential. They're from these outlying areas, they're not from the metropolitan centers. Absolutely, because, uh, yeah, you can kind of bribe your way out of conscription in, in some of these large centers, and the people in the in the outlying areas generally don't have the funds to do that. Also, the reason Putin hasn't had to call for another mass mobilization is he can offer, or the government offers, fairly large bonuses, I mean, relative to what people can earn on their own through a regular job for signing up with the military, plus death payments in the case you're, you know, you're killed in action that go to your family. So he has, you know, there's been a lot of conscription in these outlying areas and among non-ethnic Russians. And see, and these are some of the same communities for whom, you know, Moscow has always been, you know, kind of distant and remote and somewhat unpopular. So if this goes too far, then perhaps our Siberian nationalist will find the fulfillment of his dream. Right. Well, the the exiles are an extremely diverse group, even in the subsets of media and church. Mm -hmm. But is there some kind of vision for post-Putin Russia around which they might coalesce? Yeah, I mean, I think except on the margins where you do find some sort of ultra-nationalists who are upset with Putin on that score because he isn't, like, right enough, and some of those people have left Russia. Okay. Well, there are those people. Uh, generally speaking, among all of the, pe the exiles that we're talking about, the people I talked to in my book, uh, for them, a post-Putin future is a future of Russia shorn of autocracy, uh, shorn of this aggression, and in something like a you know parliamentary you know constitutional republic, which Russia now nominally has, but it's not observed. So, for example, um, there are Russians uh, in you know the more politically minded e exiles whose manifesto is to create something like a Switzerland with, you know, with a Canton system provides some kind of autonomy to regions, so a more federated system. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, in Russia right now, the governors uh, of the provinces are appointed by the Kremlin. So I think there's um, a general con consensus that a post-Putin future, you know, has to be more like a European style democracy, perhaps a parliamentary uh, democracy as or, or republic, as many people would describe it. How do you handicap the chances of that? Well, I think Russia gets a chance at, at change pretty much every generation or two, and I think it, it goes without saying it would have to be without Putin. So, I mean, the good news, you know, from their perspective, I would call it good news my, myself, is that Putin is 71 years old and he's not going to be able to last forever. There will be a post-Putin future. Um, we have seen with exile movements from the past that they can take a very long time to gestate. I think for people in the West, they have to have a sense that change in Russia does not happen in the same way. You know, it could be sudden and convulsive and not always when it's expected. I mean, a figure like Gorbachev was not really anticipated uh, in the 1980s who kind of loosened the screws on Russia. He was certainly not anticipated by our you know, CIA and intelligence uh, community mm. in Washington. So, you know, I, I, I always look at Russia through that kind of a, a lens that, you know, the change is not going to pr proceed in the sort of way that it does in uh, relatively stable societies like America.
Okay, well, I, uh, I don't believe we have time for any further questions. We're at the hour, but I did want to bring up something that uh, the Russian priest in exile says, because I thought this was quite a good note to end on. You say, even in these dark times, he refused to, come to, to succumb to despair. My knowledge is pessimistic. My faith is optimistic. And that seems rather like the motivating sentiment for many of these people, and it keeps them going. I think that's right. That's a quote from Alexander Mann, by the way, who was the murdered priest of, of 1990. Uh -huh. um, and it kept uh, Father Oleg going. So, yes, I like that as well. Okay, well, let's stay with that as our closing idea and wish the best to you and all of the people you interviewed who have done something quite courageous and lonely in doing this. Thank uh, you. But I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Our thanks to Paul Starobin, author of Putin's Exiles, The Fight for a Better Russia. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Paul's new book at your local bookstore. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort in making virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org, commonwealthclub, one word, dot org, slash events. I'm Quentin Hardy. Thank you very much, and have a great day.